What I want to do is just start with um, the beginnings of quantitative genetics, uh, which really arose um, in the late 1800s with people. Let's see, I need to advance my slide. How do I advance to the next slide? There we go. Uh, with these people, uh, on the left is uh, Francis Galton uh, and then Carl Pearson. I'm assuming you can see my cursor, my little hand, right? Is everybody, you can see it, okay. Um, and during the late 1800s, starting with Galton, um, they tried to make an empirical, um, an empirical development of something like quantitative genetics without having the genetics. And they, uh, Pearson, uh, sorry, Galton had what he called the law of ancestral heredity, which is basically a regression formula. Um, and they, um, they thought of themselves as doing a, a scientific quantitative theory of uh, inheritance. And uh, also uh, they tried to put selection into it. But basically what happened is once Mendelian genetics was available in the year 1900, um, people started working on population and quantitative genetics. And in 1918, uh, this guy here, R.A. Fisher, um, did a tour de force publishing a single paper that basically established modern quantitative genetics. There had been a, a few partial establishments before by um, by Pearson himself and uh, uh, Weinberg in Germany, but uh, Fisher's paper, which is a, an impossible paper to read, it's uh, really dense and difficult, uh, put on the map the breakdown of variance components um, into, their, into the additive dominance and environmental variance components. Um, and it, it, the correlation between relatives, and basically it allowed you to go from uh, observed covariances to inferred variance components and predict additional um, observed covariances. So it was actually a theory with some predictive value. Uh, I want to mention this guy on the right who's less well known to people working in evolutionary quantitative genetics, uh, Jay Lush. Uh, he became professor at Iowa State University in the 1930s. And he had studied with Sewell Wright, who had also developed a uh, theory similar to Fisher's. Um, and Lush is the one who put forward quantitative genetics as a, a practical tool in, um, in animal and plant breeding. And his students did a lot of the basic work there and a lot of the basic evangelism uh, to push modern quantitative genetics in the face of traditional breeding, which, uh, and I think there's a whole political story there that somebody should unravel someday. But I'm going to move on to the simple sort of model that R.A. Fisher was using in his 1918 paper. Basically, what Fisher did was to assume you had a trait, which uh, we're calling P here, and that you had a simple model explaining the trait. And the model explaining the trait was to explain it as a sum of effects from different loci. And here I've got five loci, I'm, not, I'm uh, calling them A through E. And at each locus, you can have an arbitrary number of alleles, I've shown two. Um, and uh, you can have any pattern of dominance and any size of gene effect you want. But the model doesn't have any interaction among these, um, these effects of different genes. So it's a, a model in which there's no interaction uh, variance components, um, but there's an environmental effect. So you, you basically explain the trait by starting with some sort of a starting point. People often take the, the population mean. And then you go through this scheme and you look at the genotype and you add up effects of the genes. And then you add in an environmental effect, which is drawn independently uh, from a distribution um, which has a certain variance. So, for example, here we have um, a, a genotype of, um, and you can see it's a heterozygote, the E locus, uh, capital A, capital A, capital B, capital small b, etc. Uh, and if we take this scheme up here and we try to figure out what the phenotype is going to be, we basically um, start out with a starting point of, let's say, four,
we then look at the uh, lo let's look at the e locus here well over on the trait it's heterozygous so it'll add in 0.3 uh, then if we look at the uh, a locus you add in minus two there it is in the scheme uh, the b locus sorry the c locus I'm, I'm going left to right on the genome the c locus is heterozygous so it, it adds in six uh, the uh, D locus adds in 0.7, uh, and the B locus finally on the rightmost part of the genome adds in 0.1 based on its genotype. Uh, and then we go and pick from the environmental effect. In this case, we might get 0.9. And now we can see in this row up here that um, this particular genotype has happened to give us a, a phenotype of 10. And basically, we can go through. We can imagine ourselves going through that um, genotype by genotype and coming up with the effects of the different genes and drawing an environmental effect. And if we continue to do that, um, we'll, we'll get random outcomes based on the genotype and based on the environmental effects. And one of the things we can also think of doing is using the same model to explain discrete traits. Uh, if you have a discrete trait that has um, a quantitative character which you can't see with a developmental threshold, and the developmental threshold uh, is somewhere on the scale, uh, that we could, for example, uh, make, uh, if, if the uh, threshold were at nine, um, then these underlying quantitative values, which we can't see, would translate into uh, discrete character values based on whether or not you were to the right or left of the threshold of nine. And you'll see that the 10 would become uh, to the right of the threshold and 8.8 .8 to the left of the threshold and so on. And this is called the threshold model. It was invented by Sewell Wright in the mid 1930s as an extension of the Fisherian type of quantitative genetic model. Um, I want to show you just uh, the transition from Mendelian genetics to quantitative genetics. Uh, one of the ways that can happen is when you have a lot of environmental variants in a trait. So here's an imaginary trait in this upper um, uh, in this upper uh, histogram or you know uh, distribution in which there's a single locus with three genotypes. Each has a different quantitative value. They have different frequencies, we're at, say we're at Hardy-Weinberg frequencies. If the environmental variance is very small, then really you can do quantitative genetics. And everything is really fine. If you start increasing the amount of environmental variance in the trait, and you consider instead a case that is more environmental variance, um, now you look as if you have uh, two classes of values, even though underlying you've got three. Put in more environmental variants at, down at the bottom, uh, and you start to get a trait that you would be t not be tempted to, um, uh, to analyze using uh, 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 standard Mendelian genetics, but you'd want to use quantitative genetics. Okay. And I can also show you cases uh, where um, here's a case where I've, I've tried different numbers of loci. Uh, with one locus, let's imagine a trait with uh, two phenotypic values. This is a, a locus that has dominance. Um, and there is 30% uh, of the phenotypic variation is going to be genetic. So you can see there is the effect of the single locus. You have two nice peaks. Things are not normally distributed, uh, but you could you uh, so you sort of uh, you're kind of sort of able to do Mendelian genetics. If instead you consider a case again with 30 percent of the phenotypic variance genetic, uh, but two loci, um, similar loci, loci with uh, uh, dominance of the uh, lower allele. Uh, now you get a distribution with some bumps, but it's beginning to look more continuous. If you go to five loci with the same relative balance of uh, genotypic variance and uh, environmental variance, um, now you get a distribution where you can't see individual gene effects in any way.
Uh, here's 10 loci. Everything is looking very, very normally distributed. So as you either have more environmental variants or more loci um, whose effects are, are therefore a, a bit small, um, you're forced to analyze things uh, in a quantitative genetic way. Here's a case where um, we have a, a scheme for mean phenotypes of, the, of genotypes with two loci. Uh, it does not show complete additivity. There's some epistasis here, some interaction. And you can see if you feed in more uh, environmental variants uh, that you're going from um, discreetly observable phenotypes to overlapping phenotypes to a continuous distribution of variation. Okay, um, the important uh, concept here that R.A. Fisher uh, introduced was the breakdown of variance into additive and dominance uh, parts. Here's a diagram showing um, a single locus, which has three genotypes, and we're uh, arranging them along horizontal axis according to whether <clears throat> they're A2, A2, or the heterozygote, or A1, A1. So we have two alleles, we'll call them A1 and A2. And suppose that there are, gen there are effects on the genotype in the scheme that I showed you earlier were uh, this value, this value, and that value. So the A1 allele is nearly dominant, but the heterozygote is a little bit different. And Ari Fisher went and did something which was very uh, non-obvious. Um, instead of just looking at those three values, he said, let's break it down further. Let's imagine effects of the A1 allele and effects of the A2 allele that are additive and then add to those a departure from that, which is an interaction of the two, um, which is a dominance effect. So what he did was to take their current values and weight them by their population frequencies. So what we're imagining here is a population with a frequency of, with a gene frequency of A1 um, and Hardy-Weinberg proportions. So that we're just, have a random mating population. Uh, and what we're, what we're doing is to, what R.A. Fisher did was to do a regression, uh, fit a straight line by least squares through these values, weighting the points by their population frequencies. So we've done this here. And if you then say, well, let's use those predictions, which are going to be additive. The predictions have the property that the heterozygote value is exactly intermediate between the two homozygote values. So if we assign additive effects, which we'll call alpha-1 and alpha-2 here, we assign two alpha-1s to the A1-A1, alpha-1 plus alpha-2 to the heterozygote, and alpha-2 plus alpha-2 to the homozygote. So Fisher does this sort of fictional breakdown of um, fictional imagining of a perfectly additive effect. And then he says, well, the actual effect of the genotype is, um, is going to be, excuse me, is going to be um, a departure from that. So the actual phenotype, the, the mean effect on the phenotype of the A1A1 locus is alpha one plus alpha one plus a thing called the dominance deviation which is delta 1-1. One, one. Well, you might wonder why Fisher is bothering to do this. It's a very, uh, very non-obvious thing to do. Um, and let's move here. Uh, we're assuming random mating, so there's Hardy-Weinberg proportions. Fisher is also assuming that the different loci are in linkage equilibrium. There's no association of alleles at different loci, um, what's called LD, linkage disequilibrium. Um, so we're in a population that's just been mating at random and um, it's gotten to linkage equilibrium and everybody's in Hardy-Weinberg proportions. The environmental effects are assumed to be independent of the genotype, which is not always true. Um, and environmental effects in different individuals, and this is a very important assumption, um, are independent as well. So me and my brother have environmental effects that are 
completely independent. There's no shared family effect built into this model. Uh, and of course, there's no interaction between loci. The result of all that is that when you do this, this Fisherian regression at each locus and you assign, you imagine yourself assigning these alphas and deltas, something which the user of Fisher's theory never does and never they never see those values, um, but you imagine yourself doing them. Um, then you get two alphas at a locus. Because of Hardy-Weinberg, those are uncorrelated. Um, you, you cannot predict from the one which, how, what the alpha contribution will be from the other. Um, the delta turns out to be uncorrelated as well uh, for reasons having to do with the least squares regression. Um, so that's, that's really a, an important reason for doing a least squares there. Um, and at different loci, the alphas and deltas are not correlated because the genotypes at different loci are completely uncorrelated. So what Fisher has done, and the environmental effect is independent, so what Fisher has done is take the phenotype and fictionally break it up into this sum where you have a, st a constant starting point that's the same for everybody. And then for a particular individual, you'll have some alphas, a delta at the first locus, some alphas and a delta at the second locus, and so on, and finally an environmental effect. And you might wonder, why is anybody doing this? Why is it uh, of any importance to do this? Um, and in a moment, we'll see that it actually achieves something that's really remarkable. Um, so here we go with the same sum, and all I've done is rearrange the terms. So we have you can imagine the phenotype of an individual uh, being the constant plus all the effects, all the additive effects at the different loci added up, and all the dominance deviations at the different loci added up, and finally uh, the environmental effect here. By the way, I put a dot 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 here, which shouldn't be there because it's just the additive effects plus the dominance effects, uh, dominance deviations plus the environmental effect. And by the way, as a, uh, as a side effect, because you'll be seeing this term, the mean starting point plus all the additive effects has a, uh, a name. It's called the breeding value. And when you're, when you're dealing with, uh, when Patrick Carter is talking about inference of um, breeding values, uh, you'll see this coming up. So in effect, what Fisher has done is to break up the phenotype into four fictional parts. There's a starting point, there's the sum of all the additive effects, the sum of all the dominance deviations, and the environmental effect. And furthermore, by the assumptions of Hardy-Weinberg and by the assumptions of linkage equilibrium, um, these are statistically uncorrelated with each other. So the result is that the variance of phenotype from individual to individual um, is the variance due to this A term plus the variance due to the D term plus the variance due to the E term. In other words, it's an additive variance. The first is called the additive genetic variance. The second is the dominance variance. And the third is the environmental variance. So now there's this fictional breakdown of variances. And you might, you might very well say, well, so what? So he can do this fictional assorting of variances. What good does that do anybody? Well, let's see. Um, if I have some random variables, x, y, and z, this is a little technical aside, um, we could imagine making a sum of x plus y and a sum of x plus z. So now we have two variables, two random variables, and they share a part which is the same, and they have parts y and z that are different. Um, and if I ask about the covariance, and for many of you, I hope you're, I hope you have some idea what a covariance is. It's something like a correlation, but scaled differently. Um, the covariance between x plus y and x plus z turns out to always be the variance of the part that they share. If they have these three independent parts, x, y, and z, x plus y covariates with x plus z, and the covariance is equal to the, sh to the variance of the shared part. 
So if you take that and you apply it to the phenotypes of two related individuals, so you have two relatives, and we call the phenotype of this one P sub X and the phenotype of that one P sub Y, then each of them is a sum of these mean plus, uh, starting points, sorry, plus additive effects, plus dominance effects and environment. But some of those are shared so that, for example, um, if I have a parent and an offspring, half of the alphas have to be the same because they, the, we know when we know what the allele is at the first locus in the parent, we may know then what an allele is in the offspring. We'll actually get to this. If you have these relatives and the relatives are such that a fraction F1 of the alphas are shared and a fraction F2 of the deltas are shared, you can actually work out the covariance of those of the phenotypes of those two relatives. So if I go out in the population and I select parent offspring pairs, independent of each other, but each pair has a parent and its offspring, so they're not independent of each other, it will turn out that the covariance of those is equal to a fraction F1 of the additive genetic variance. And that's simply because there's a fraction F1 of these alphas that are shared. And similarly for the uh, dominance deviations, um, a fraction F2 of those are shared. So the contribution to the covariance is F2 times the dominance variance. So um, what you can do is, let's see, uh, let, me, let me just do an aside. R.A. Fisher developed this rather unusual theory uh, in 1918. And if you're familiar with analysis of variance, ANOVA, it will have a familiar flavor to it. Um, Gesundheit. Um, and somebody sneezed, didn't they? Oh, okay, good. We have that good communication. Um, all right. The... Um, uh, it, uh, you may look at this and say, um, this has some feel that is similar to uh, analysis of variance where we have, we have effects of rows and effects of columns and interaction effects and random effects within cells. Um, why is it so similar to analysis of variance? Well, the answer, of course, is who developed analysis of variance? It was R.A. Fisher. He developed it in the early 1920s, so very soon after his 1918 uh, paper. Um, and the, um, the additive effects are like row or column effects. The dominance deviations are a particular kind of two-way interaction effect. Um, we've zeroed out a lot of other possible environmental uh, interaction effects. Um, and the least squares regression that Fisher is doing in his quantitative genetics theory is in fact the exact same thing that's done in the analysis of variance. So all this is part, this plus analysis of variance are really part of the same intellectual development. Uh, well, to get back to covariances of relatives, um, you can look at a, at a relationship, you can look at, for example, an uncle and a nephew, and you can figure out what's the probability of a single copy of a gene um, also being found in a relative. So if I take um, a um, if I take a gene and I'm the uncle, uh, and I look at one of my genes and I say, what is the chance that that gene will show up in my nephew uh, as a result of identity by descent? Um, not just randomly coming from the population, but because I am the uncle, um, that gene was in my sibling and was passed on to the uh, to the nephew. And you can work out what that probability F1 is, which for an uh, uncle-nephew relationship would be one quarter. Um, and you can do the same thing for the probability that both copies at a locus, if I look at me and my brother, uh, and I take the two copies in me, uh, and I can say, what's the chance that my brother has exactly those same two copies as a result of uh, receiving them from my mother and father? 
Uh, so you can work out F1 and F2 just from the uh, degree of relationship. It's just a matter of simple Mendelian genetics. And then you have a formula for the covariance for this kind of relative. So you can immediately see that starting from um, a set of relationships, you can figure out the covariances of all of the um, uh, of all kinds of relatives. Now you might you might argue, whoops, uh, you might argue that um, uh, well, this is all very well, but who told us what these additive effects were and dominance effects? Where did we get those? We're generally dealing with traits that have no. Um, uh, we don't know how many loci are involved. We don't know the patterns. Uh, we don't know gene frequencies. We don't know patterns of uh, dominance or anything. Where did you get those? And the answer actually is we use different degrees of relationship to infer using this formula to figure out what the covariances are, work out from that estimates of VA and VD, so and this is a theory that lets you go from something observable, the covariances between relatives, through some to infer something that um, about the that otherwise would require you to know how many loci are involved and exactly what their gene frequencies are, which you don't know, and then go and predict the covariances of other relatives. So, for example, um, if I take parent and offspring pairs from a population. Uh, I can figure out that F1 is equal to a half and F2 is equal to zero. Um, and then we can work out that the covariance of parents and offspring should be half the additive, half of V sub A, the additive genetic variance. And um, so if I can work out the covariance of parents and offspring, I just double that and I get an estimate of D sub A. And you can work similarly with sibling, with full siblings and get estimates of V sub D. And then you can use Fisher's theory to predict, for example, uh, covariance of uh, aunts and nieces, covariances of uh, double first cousins, all sorts of other uh, interesting uh, uh, covariances of other degrees of relationship. So this theory actually does relate observables, and it relates it in a way that does not require you to know uh, exactly what the genes are and what they're doing. Well, we're... Let me get um, just a moment here. Yeah. Uh, let, let me go on to the issue of heritability. Um, you're having gotten estimates of the variance components, you can compute some interesting quantities. One of the ones that everybody focuses on is the heritability, uh, which was actually de discovered by, uh, defined by Sewell Wright in the early 1920s. And all it is is the fraction of the total variance, which comes from the V sub A term, comes from the additive genetic term. Now, people tend to misuse heritability. They tend to think of it as a, a universal constant that holds for a trait. And so you say the heritability is uh, 0.4, and someone will then assume that that will apply to um, all sorts of different populations for that trait. And that's not actually true because it depends on the gene frequencies in the population. And therefore, if I go to a different population, the heritability may be different. Um, it is also not a coefficient of genetic determination because it's only measuring the fraction of the variance that's due to this V sub A term. It's not measuring another contribution to the uh, genetic variance, and that is V sub D. The total genetic variance is V sub A plus V sub D, um, not, not just V sub A. Also, as the gene frequencies change through time as a result either of uh, genetic drift or natural selection, um, the additive genetic variances can change through time and the dominance variances. And so these are not also uh, universal constants that hold, hold over all time, but they do have some very... Uh, some interesting use. Um, let me just see here. Yeah, in selection. So having gotten this machinery for estimating these variance components and relating different covariances of relatives to each other, um, how was this helpful to, uh, to animal and plant breeders? 
Um, and the answer comes when you consider the effects of selection. Um, here is a plot of uh, parent offspring values for an imaginary trait. Um, and we have um, values in the parent going from 6 to 14. And similarly, in the offspring, we make a, a distribution. So this is what you might get if you collected uh, a large number of, um, of pairs, of parent offspring pairs. And if they then run a regression line through them, there's, there's the regression line. You expect the slope of this regression line to be the covariance of the two relatives divided by the variance of the horizontal value, which will be the variance of the phenotype of the parents. And you can work out from those variance component formulas trivially in one step that it's half the heritability. It's half the fraction of the variance that's due to, to the additive uh, uh, component variance. Now, if you take that um, slope, if you take that plot of uh, parents and offspring, um, and you take a parent and you ask what the average of its offspring will be. So suppose I go into a population, I pick up a whole lot of parent offspring pairs, and then I say, suppose I take a parent whose um, phenotype is, is maybe 11.7. Uh, now using this plot and using the predicted regression, if I were to know the, um, the variance components, I could predict that the mean of the offspring that you would get, which is the mean of the dots that are distributed roughly here in the diagram, would be at the regression line, and therefore here is the mean of the offspring. Well, that's, that seems of mildly interesting, but actually it's incredibly interesting to a, a breeder who's trying to breed these, um, these creatures. Uh, if I now say, okay, let's take a herd and let's breed only from individuals who are, are above a certain cutoff. So here is a selection cutoff line, this vertical line here. We're plotting only the individuals who are to the right of it. We discarded all the other individuals. We're going to breed from these individuals. I, what I can do is show that the mean of the selected individuals, oh, let's see, if I look at these dots and I measure their horizontal values, they will have a, an average. This is the mean of the selected parents. And I now say, um, let's ask about the average of the offspring that are resulting from breeding only from these selected individuals. And it will be here predicted as a result of the regression line. I should say that's for the case where we only selected on one of the parents. So for example, we might be selecting on the male parents um, and letting the female parents be random. Then we would get this, this amount of selection response. So you're beginning to see that uh, the Fisherian variance component scheme actually allows you a prediction of selection response for a simple case of uh, truncation selection. And the result of all this is what's called the breeder's equation. Um, if you selection, select on both parents instead of on one parent, the case I showed you was one parent. Um, if you now select on both parents, basically the selection response is doubled. And the result of it is this very simple formula, which is called the breeder's equation. And that says that if I select a bunch of parents which have a selection differential in that they, we know how many units of the character they are above the population mean. So, for example, um, if I select um, on individuals whose body weight um, is 100 kilograms greater think of cows or something, 100 kilograms greater than the population average. So we're breeding from individuals who are higher than the population mean by 100 kilograms. Then if you simply multiply that by the heritability, you make a prediction of the selection response. So the Fisher quantitative genetics theory, by coming up with these fictional variance components, ones that you 
you cannot get by looking at the genes, but you have to get indirectly by looking at um, covariances of relatives. Um, also allows you to predict response to different strengths of, of uh, selection. And in the hands of uh, Jay Lush and his students and other quantitative genetics, uh, geneticists of the 1930s, um, they were able to work out all sorts of cases where you did schemes of family selection, where you did multivariate traits and um, selection indices. Um, there really was a lot of very basic work done during that era. Um, and the breeder's equation then gave you a prediction of what would happen with different strengths of, of artificial selection. So to finish up, um, I just want to show you some of the references uh, of the, for the, this basic stuff on quantitative genetics. Here's R.A. Fisher's great paper of 1918. Um, it is absolutely impossible to read. The only way to read it is to take a whole seminar full of students and work your way page by page, week by week. Uh, it's an incredibly painful experience. I've tried it. Uh, it almost doesn't work. Here is Jay Lush's book, Animal Breeding Plans, which is of historical interest. Uh, there's an online uh, version of it available. And it's the book that brought quantitative genetics into animal breeding. Um, the greatest, um, well, one of the greatest quantitative genetics books ever written was by Douglas Falconer in 1960. And he was joined on late by later on later editions by Trudy Mc. Trudy Mackay. Uh, there's some ambiguity as to how you pronounce Trudy's name. She's Canadian. She's at University of uh, North Carolina State University in, in Raleigh. Uh, so Americans call her Mackay, and I, um, I met her in Scotland, so I call her Mackay. Um, Introduction to Quantitative Genetics is a beautifully clear book and uh, really became the essential, um, the essential text of quantitative genetics from 1960 onward. After 1998, it's very effectively competed with by Michael Lynch and Bruce Walsh's book, uh, Genetics and the Analysis of Quantitative Traits. So these are two fundamental uh, texts of the theory of uh, quantitative genetics. And finally, um, Lynch and Walsh are writing a volume two, except that it, volume two got so long that it's going to be a two-volume volume two. So it's going to be very strange. I, I don't know what it'll look like. Will it be volume one, two, and three, or it'll be volume one and volume 2A and 2B? I'm not sure. But Bruce has been posting material from uh, volume two, from the two volumes of volume two on his website. And you can access this link and get a lot of advanced material that's not covered in the uh, first volume of Lynch and Walsh. And finally, I have a theoretical evolutionary genetics text that I use in teaching a, a theoretical population genetics course. Uh, it's available at this link. Um, and in chapter nine uh, and chapter 11, I cover um, the material that I've been talking about here, plus in chapter 11, some of the uh, material on quantitative characters under optimizing selection in models of, of what's going on in natural populations. And that relates to the rest of the material in the course. So knowing that Steve wants to start talking at 1030, uh, 1130, I'm sorry, it's, it's, eight, it's 820 here. Um, I wonder uh, whether anyone has any questions about the material that I uh, have been presenting. Um, does the dominance um, term that you were talking about, does that uh, encompass epistas epistasis at all? Well, I, I missed the last few words. Does, it, the, does the dominance component do what? Does it, um, in, like the, does it encompass epistatic interactions between those loci at all? Uh, n no. In the scheme that I was giving you, um, the dominance... Um, the, the dominance term is for the interaction of the two copies at a single locus. And you have these, these dominance deviations. And for the scheme I was giving you, there was no epistasis at all. Uh, the theory can be extended. It was extended in the 1950s uh, by Clark Cockerham and uh, Oscar Kempthorne to include higher order um, 
higher order variance components due to due to epistasis. But the scheme I was giving you, uh, no, there was uh, the dominance. The, the the dominance variance component does not include any epistasis. We'll do epistasis in the next lecture. So there are obviously a lot of assumptions that we know are false that go into uh, Fisher's model, um, and it seems to work really well for the traits that have been looked at in humans and agricultural species, which we know um, are very weird due to their demography, and in particular for height, which we know is a classical polygenic, extremely polygenic trait. Um, do we know how well this works in uh, outside systems of humans and uh, domesticated animals? Is there well, I, I'm having trouble hearing, hearing, but you're asking, I think, how well how well the models like this work in, in situations like natural populations, is that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I really refer you to, uh, to Steve <laughs> because uh, he works with uh, natural populations uh, of, of garter snakes. Um, I'm a theoretician, how should I know? <laughs> you know? Uh, Steve, the, uh, I, my impression is that people can successfully use um, the Fisher, uh, the simplified Fisher model, um, not just in animal breeding, but um, in natural populations. And Russ Landy really was the person who in the 1970s and 1980s um, proposed doing that and came up with particular formulations, versions of the selection response, uh, the breeder's equation, for example, that would apply to the kinds of selection that we would see in nature. But I think in terms of the traits themselves, um, the program of looking at them just as quantitative genetic traits uh, that are, um, you know, quantitative traits just like, you know, back fat thickness in pigs or uh, shank length in chickens, uh, I think it's been a very successful program. So Steve, do you agree with that? I agree with that. We'll talk about it more later. Um, well, first of all, I think it's really neat that you can work your way back for, backwards from covariances or relatives and figure out the shared additive effects. But if you look at the, your beginning slide on the standard quantitative genetic model, so it's um, slide three, it's all the way <laughs> in the front. Uh, so uh, let's go, let me go back there. Here? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Uh, so practical question for a theoretician. If you could measure these kind of things, what would be the numbers next to the genotypes or the number you assign to the environmental effect? What are those practically? What would you measure? And so what is well, the minus two, zero? I, I, think, I think you could, you could uh, I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but I think if you had total control, if you were able to create individuals of any genotype you wanted, then you could take a particular genotype, for example, this first one up here, and you could look at the first locus and say, well, let's uh, manipulate the genome. Let's change big A, big A into the heterozygote. And then you could make a different genotype and you could see how large that difference was. Okay. And you could you could do that for all the genes. You could change one gene at a time. Um, and you could basically fill in this table here with numbers if you could do, if you could do that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I took your question to be that, that is, would there be a way yeah. if we could do total uh, genetic manipulations yeah, to was... actually fill in such a model? Yeah, that was, that was good. Thank you. Yeah, and, and let, me, let me just say that, however, however, if you did that, in a sense, you don't need quantitative genetics after that. You can, you can sort of think of in terms of standard Mendelian genetics. We're doing quantitative genetics because we can't do that. We have to work indirectly through the, from the covariances of relatives, the, the, uh, um, the similarity of sibs or the similarity of parents and offspring. Yeah, and work backwards. Yeah. And then we get the variance components, but we still don't know how many loci there are. Um, and for a while, when I was lecturing on this, 
um, in my theoretical population genetics course. Uh, in recent years, I started doubting whether I should give those lectures. And I said, look, uh, we're going to, uh, genomicists are going to be working out uh, exactly what these loci are doing. Maybe we don't need quantitative genetics anymore. Uh, but it's turned out rather differently. Uh, genomics is able to find the, the genes of largest effect. And then there's a, a, a background of, of further genetic variation that we can't find. Um, by genomic methods. So I think quantitative genetics is maybe unfortunately still alive and well. Um, and in traits like human height, they've only been able to find about, you know, 10, 15 percent, loci accounting for 10, 15 percent of the variation. Um, and so you, you still have to think in quantitative genetic terms in spite of uh, some decades of genomic work. Definitely. Thank you. Hi. Uh my name is Roberto from, from Chile. Uh, I, it's kind of amazing to have this lecture here and have a lot of questions, but I wonder, related to f Fisher work, uh, do you know how they, he came out with this precise definition of genes at that time, so just from the work of Mendel? How 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 was the the story about this? Well, Fisher Fisher was working um, in the two decades that followed uh, the rediscovery of Gregor Mendel's work. That was in the in the year 1900 when uh, three different people uh, called attention to, uh, to to Mendelian genetics, and then there was great excitement about Mendelian genetics in the decade of the 1900s and on into the 1910s, which was a big decade of uh, further development. So by the time Fisher, and Fisher was paying a lot of attention to that, uh, by the time he did his 1918 paper, people knew that the genes are located on chromosomes. They knew they had different alleles. Um, Hardy-Weinberg proportions had been worked out. Um, so a lot of the basics that we now understand were available to Fisher. He, he had a very good understanding. He, he uh, of Mendelian genetics and classical genetics. Of course, nobody knew what the chemical basis of uh, the genes was, but for the purposes of this theory, you don't have to know. I mean, the genes could be made out of protein and this theory still works. Is that is that your question? Yeah, yeah, pretty much, thank you. So based on this formulation, my understanding is, is because heritability is dependent upon uh, gene frequency or allele frequency within larger populations, if I'm uh, continually applying a selective pressure, uh, like a recurrent selective pressure, my heritability will go down as, uh, as I select towards an optimum? Well, um, you'd think it would, yes, but it's not entirely true. Um, if you had a trait in which the, um, the positive alleles are recessive and rare, then as you apply selection, they will become more common. And as they become more common, as the gene frequencies go up, in that particular case, the additive genetic variance can increase and the heritability can go up. So it depends on the gene frequencies that you're starting with um, and, you know, the, at, at all these different alleles. Uh, in, in a way that doesn't permit you to make a simple ex, um, prediction that, that additive genetic variance will always go down. It, it can sometimes go up. But in the long run, if, if due to selection or due to genetic drift, all of the alleles start to go to, a, to frequencies of one or zero, uh, then the formulas for additive genetic variance uh, drop to zero, uh, the heritability of the trait would, would drop to zero in the long run. But in the short run, uh, there isn't a simple uh, prediction that the additive genetic variance uh, will always go down. 